Hi, welcome back to our study on the age to come. I trust that you've worked through session one and two. Very important to really see the entire picture of what we are trying to paint from biblical text in comparison of the prophets to the New Testament, to really see what God, the prophets, Yeshua and the apostles, as well as the book of Revelation, says about the age to come. Now, this is session three, and let's continue. Today we are going to discuss the Prince of Peace, which is Yeshua, the Messiah. So in the Old Testament prophet of Ezekiel, chapter 45, verse 17, and it shall be that the prince, who is this prince? The prince of peace in the millennium. If you And for this is the reason why you had to do the previous studies, because all throughout the scriptures of Ezekiel, chapter 44, Malachi 4, Isaiah 66, we really went into depth to explain who the God is, who the prince is, and who the end-time nation and where the end-time nation will end up and who they are. So it shall be that the princes part to give burnt offerings and meat offerings and drink offerings in the feasts and in the new boons and in the Sabbaths. So here we can see that the Prince of Peace will lead the worship service of God together with the priests that we discussed in the previous session. And again, I have to ask, are you sure that God's feast days and his new moons and his Sabbaths, as we saw even in the prophet Isaiah, as well as in Revelation and all the other texts that I showed you in the previous sessions, are you really sure that this is not for you? They will be done in the age to come. So in the age to come, the Prince of Peace himself will lead the sons of Zadok in righteousness because Zadok, the root word is Tzadikim, and they are the righteous ones. And all of Israel, so the Zadokian priests and all of Israel, um, will worship the Father, Almighty God. His name is Yotei Vavei. But the Prince of Peace will lead us in that worship, just like Yeshua said, I am the only way to Yahuwah. Note also how the Sabbaths and the feasts are eternal and has never been set aside as the church teaches. Yeshua served as the word of God all throughout the ages. You've got John 1 verse 1 for that. Now Yeshua is serving as the high priest of God, Hebrews 4 and Hebrews 9. And of course, he makes intercession for us right now as high priest, Romans 8 verse 34. But when he comes again, his priestly robes will be taken off and he will be dressed in his royal robes. So he will change from high priest to the prince of peace. Right, and this happens here in Daniel. So Daniel says in chapter 7 verse 13, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man, Yeshua called himself the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, which is Almighty Yotevave. And they brought Yeshua near before Yahuwah. And there was given to Yeshua dominion, glory, and a kingdom, so that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall never pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Remember, we saw this a million times. I've showed you. All people, nations, and languages will serve him in the age to come. Remember Isaiah 66, verse 23? And there'll come a time when all flesh will worship before me, says your, your Tevafe. Back to Ezekiel. This prince of peace, once he has changed from his role as high priest into his royal role, we need to understand that both the priestly and the royal service that he does is really explained to us by Melchizedek. Melchizedek is made up of two Hebrew words. The first is Melech, which means king. And in the book of Genesis, we read about Melchizedek. He was the king of Salem, which is, of course, Yeru Salem, Jerusalem. And he is Melech Tzadik, Melech of Tzedaka. And Tzedaka is righteousness. That is why he will lead the 
sons of Zadok, which means righteousness, in the worshipping of Father Yahuwah in the age to come. So as the true Melchizedek, Melech Tzadik, um, he is the king of righteousness. Melech means king, Tzedaka is righteousness. So he's the Melech of righteousness, the king of of righteousness, yet he's also the high priest. Because if you read Genesis 14 and Hebrews 7, you'll see that this king, Melech Tzadik, was the high priest to whom Abraham paid tithing. Therefore, the Messiah can lead the priestly worship as our prince. Back to Ezekiel 45, the Prince of Peace will have his part in the burnt offerings and in the worship of the feast days, new moons and Sabbaths. Together with all those who follow the ordinances of God through which we will be able to enter into the new Jerusalem. And as he then says in Ezekiel 44 verse 23, they will teach my people, these priests will teach my people to differentiate between what's acceptable to God and what is not acceptable to him. So just as a summary, the Prince of Peace of Ezekiel 45 is the same as the Word of God in John 1 verse 1. That is the High Priest, according to Hebrews 4 and 9. And that makes intercession for us. But just before he comes back, he will stop with his priestly service that's being done in heaven. And that is why he says in Revelation 22, he that's filthy, let him remain filthy. Because why? Because now the high priest is no longer making intercession. Now his priestly robes are taken off and he's dressed as a king. To this king is given dominion, glory and a kingdom. And yet, he is a kingly priest. He is the true Melech Tzadik. We've talked about the East Gate quite a lot in the previous session. And here in Ezekiel 46 verse 1, we read that the gate of the inner court that looks towards the East shall be shut six working days. Why? The Bible says in the age to come, we'll be planting and harvesting and Everyone will sit under his own fig tree and nobody will steal your harvest from you anymore. There will be no enemies to God's people who lives with him in um, Israel. And for six days we'll be working, just like Adam and Eve who lived in paradise. You know, that was the um, ultimate plan God had. Um, but still, for six days they worked. They tended the garden, but there was, you know, there was no curse on earth yet. But God still wants us to be busy, not sit on a cloud in heaven playing a harp, like, you know, we've been taught all our lives. So this gate will be shut six working days, but on the Sabbath and on the new moon, it shall be opened. So again, the question is, are you sure Shabbat, Shabbat and new moon is not for you? And the prince, who's this prince? The prince of peace. Of Ezekiel 45. The prince will enter by the way of the porch of that gate. Do you remember how I showed you in the previous session? In Ezekiel 44, that God said, Shut the east gate, because I, God, entered through that east gate. And now the east gate is for the prince to come in. So once the east gate is um, opened after six days on the Sabbath or the new moon, the prince shall enter by the way of the porch of that specific gate. Likewise, all the people of the land, which land? Not all the people of the world. Because remember, after Armageddon, there's quite a few nations left that, you know, we, we still have to do a whole Bible study on that. But basically, on the first resurrection, um, only God's people, who has been grafted into his olive tree, and whose name is now the Israel of God. And for that, you have to do the Who is Israel Bible study. I'm not going to explain all of that again. Um, I show you out of Scripture that only Israel will be in the kingdom of God one day. And of course, that includes all the Gentile nations that are grafted back into the olive tree. Just like Rahab was a Gentile. And she got grafted into the olive tree. And so Paul explains to us beautifully in the New Testament. But for that, please do the Israel Bible study. 
So all the people of the land of Israel shall worship at the door of this gate. Which gate? The east gate, you see. So all the people will follow their prince. We follow Messiah Yeshua um, to this gate before Yahuwah in the Sabbaths and the new moons. Remember I showed you that Isaiah said, in the new heaven and the new earth, we will all come up to worship on Sabbath and new moons. So you can see how all these end day prophecies of Ezekiel, Zechariah, and Isaiah confirms that the prince and the prince's people will be worshiping Yahuwah together during the millennium from Jerusalem on the Sabbaths and the new moons. So the gate of the inner court that looks towards the east will be open to remind Israel in the age to come of how holy, important, and valuable the Sabbath days are. As God created in the beginning, his, his ultimate plan revolved around the Sabbath day. Six days Adam and Eve had to work, and on the Sabbath they spent time with Yahuwah. And so it will be in the ultimate paradise as well. The prince and his people will worship Yahuwah at the east gate of Jerusalem on the Sabbaths and the new moons. Does this sound like the Messiah you are worshipping now? If not, you might need to look at the Messiah again in the New Testament. You will see that Yeshua always directed all worship to Yahuwah. And Yeshua always kept all the Sabbaths and all the feast days, as did Paul, Peter, John, James and everyone else, even after the resurrection of Messiah. And just as a reminder, Isaiah 66, it will come to pass in the new heaven and the new earth. This is not in the dispensation of the Old Testament. No, this is in God's newly created heaven and earth. Once the new Jerusalem comes down, and God and Yeshua is echad, one again, and his people are one, with one king over them. This is the age to come, the new heaven and the new earth, that from one new moon and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says Yahuwah. This is God's words, not any religious person that's trying to bring you under the law. Please look at this very carefully and understand how God's kingdom will be in the age to come. And then you ask yourself, do you want to be part of that? So why not start the practicing now? The Sabbath days and the feast days are called a moadim, which in Hebrew has the meaning of appointed times. Dress rehearsals, dates that we have with our God. And that's why the Bible, Ezekiel 44 and Ezekiel um, 20 and Ezekiel 12, for that matter, and Deuteronomy 30, all confirms that the mark of God is his Sabbath days. So for his people to be marked during this time up to the end, before the age to come starts, we need to come into those cycles so that we are in routine and in sync with our Father and Creator Yahuwah. Right, now to a lovely explanation of the tree of life and the river of life. Ezekiel 47 and Revelation 22. Let's compare all the New Testament. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on the banks of the river, on the side, on this side, and on that side of the river, shall grow all trees for meat or for food, for, for uh, fruit. And their leaves shall not fade. Just before we continue, let me just remind you of one thing. Go and read Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of the sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. Because the um, ungodly, the ungodly, the sinners, and the scornful are not finding their delight in the law of Yahuwah. Only those men that are blessed because they are not walking in the ways of the sinners. They find their delight in the law of Yahuwah, and they meditate on his law day and night. They will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth their fruit, and their leaves does not wither. Exactly like we see here in Ezekiel 47. They leave 
will not fade. Neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, twelve months in a year. Because why? The waters, what waters? Remember, this tree is on the banks on this side and on that side of the bank of the river. Where does this river or this water come from? The waters come from the sanctuary. Where is the sanctuary? Oh, let me remind you. Revelation 21 verse 2. I, John, saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And I heard a great voice that said, Behold, the tabernacle of God is now with men, and he shall dwell with them here on earth. So, where is the sanctuary? Here on earth. Whose sanctuary is it? The sanctuary of Yahuwah that came out of heaven. So, Revelation 22 verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. All right? Where's the throne of God? In the sanctuary. Ezekiel says the river flows out of the sanctuary. Revelation says exactly the same. It says the river flows out of the throne of God who's in the sanctuary. I hope you understand the sanctuary or the tabernacle to understand that God's throne is called the mercy seat, which is the lid that's upon the Ark of the Covenant. Again, you sure the covenant of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is not for you? And in the middle of the street of it, and on either side of the river, just like Ezekiel said, on this side and on that side of the river, you know? There was the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruit, and yielding her fruit every month, just like Ezekiel says. It will bring forth fruit according to the months. And, Revelation, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Remember here it says in Ezekiel that the leaves shall not fade. Why? Because, Revelation they are for the healing of the nations. And this is also confirmed by the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. The fruit thereof shall be for fruit to eat, and the leaf will be for medicine. Exactly like Revelation, the, the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. No longer can you say all this of Ezekiel and Zechariah and Isaiah is Old Testament because surely you now confirm and recognize the confirmation in the book of Revelation. So either Revelation and the age to come and the new heaven and the new earth is for you or it isn't. It's no longer Old Testament. Yeshua said a million times, the law and the prophets testify of me. How many times did Paul say he can only explain to the people how Messiah is the, how Yeshua is the Messiah from the law and the prophets? And this amazing book of Zechariah, in his last chapter, Zechariah 14, confirms everything that we read in the book of Revelation. Look at Zechariah 14, verse 4. In that day, his feet, whose feet? The Prince of Peace, shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. Do you remember how I showed you in the book of Ezekiel, how he was prophesying the Prince coming into Jerusalem through the east gate? And now I confirm this from Acts 1, verse 11 where the angel said, This Yeshua is taken up from you into heaven. From where? From Mount Olives. You will so see him come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven at the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, just like Zechariah 14 says. Zechariah 14 verse 8, In that day, which day? When his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. In that day, it shall be that living waters will flow from Jerusalem. And here I remind you, Revelation 22 verse 1, He showed me a pure river of the waters of life. Oh, the living waters of Zechariah, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and his Son. And look at John 4 verse 10. Yeshua answered and said to her, If you would have asked him, the Messiah, he would have given you living water. 
because Yeshua will flow from Jerusalem. Yeshua is the living water. Yeshua is the prince, the Melech Tzadik, that gives living water to those who are with him in the Holy Land once the age to come has come. You can also look at Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 17, Zechariah 14, and John 7. So let's look at Jeremiah 17. O Yahuwah, yeah, um, the prophet is speaking to Yahuwah. And in the New Testament, of course, we know that Yeshua is called the living waters because Yahuwah and Yeshua is one. They are a chat. Yeshua says, me and my father, we are one. So if the Old Testament says Yahuwah is the living waters and the New Testament say, say Yeshua is the living waters, we know the living waters are the same thing. Therefore, Yahuwah and Yeshua are one. Jeremiah 17, O Yahuwah, the expectation of Israel, very important. How are Israel expecting Yahuwah to come? O Yahuwah, all, let all who forsake you be put to shame. Those who depart from me, Yahuwah, shall be written in the earth. Because why? Why will I write the names in the earth of those who depart from me? Because they have forsaken me, Yahuwah. How have they forsaken me? I am the fountain of living water. So Zechariah 14 and Jeremiah 17 and of course Revelation. And now let's expand a little bit on this age to come. Remember we are still in Zechariah 14 talking about the age to come when the prince will um, land with his feet on the Mount of Olives and the living waters will flow from Jerusalem. Then Yahuwah shall be king or sovereign over all the earth. In that day there shall be one God and his name. And Yahuwah shall be sovereign or king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one God and his name one. This of course reminds us of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 where God says, Yer o Israel, is not speaking to any other nation. Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. Yeshua says in Mark 12, the first of all commandments, the most important of all commandments is Yer O Israel, Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And of course, this word Yer means to listen and obey. And Ezekiel 37 verse 21 agrees with Zechariah 14 and Mark 12 and Deuteronomy 6. See, I'm taking the children of Israel from among the nations. Remember I showed you Israel scattered into the Gentile nations and those who shema, those who listen and obey, are grafted back into the olive tree. Go and read Romans 12. So see, I'm taking the children of Israel from among all the nations, every tribe, nation and tongue on the earth, wherever they have gone, and I shall gather them from all around and I shall bring them into their land. Because we believe in the covenant that God made with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. And Yeshua says, if you believe in me, you are the seed of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. So God himself will bring us to Jerusalem or Israel. And I shall make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Oh, remember Mount Zion. And one king shall be sovereign over them all. Who? Zechariah 14. There will be one king over them. Ezekiel 37, one king over them, and let them no longer be two nations. I showed you the house of Judah and the house of Israel, the older brother and the prodigal son. We've dealt with this more than enough now. They will no longer be two nations, and let them no longer be divided into two kingdoms. Joel 3 verse 7, and this is of course end time prophecy. The prophet Joel is always about the end days. Then you shall know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who, when you dwell in Zion, my set-apart mountain, when you live in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be set apart. So this is all about the end days. We see in Zechariah, God will be one. We see this God is explained in the Torah, in Deuteronomy 6, where he, sees, where he says, Yer Israel, I am one. Love me with all your heart, your soul, and then the rest of the commandments, you know them. Yeshua confirmed, I and my Father are one. And he says, this is the greatest commandment. 
to know if you are Israel, that your God is one, and to love this God that is prophesied all over the Old Testament. And of course, he said himself in John 10 verse 30, I and my father are one. Then the Jews wanted to stone him. And he asked them, why do you want to stone me? And they said, because you are making yourself to be God. Because Yeshua is one with his father. They are not separated. Just because Yeshua is the fleshly manifestation of Yahuwah on earth, since the beginning, you know, the whole Bible, Old and New Testament says, nobody has ever seen the face of God and lived, yet Moses saw somebody, Abraham saw somebody. You better do the Bible studies to really understand this God of ours. So just join two trees in the Garden of Eden and do the Bible studies with us. And Zechariah continues in the last chapter, and they will dwell in her. In who? Jerusalem. And there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. We will live in peace. Revelation 21 confirms, I, Yohanan, John, saw the renewed Jerusalem, and there is no more death. There is no more utter destruction. There shall be no more mourning or crying in Revelation. There shall be no more pain for the former matters. The, the existing things have all passed away. And then we will dwell in her. There will be no more destruction and Jerusalem will be safe. This is the prophet Zechariah prophesying what Revelation confirms. And now we can get a little bit into who these nations are when Israel is gathered from all the nations and they worship together with our prince. They worship Yahuwah and they work for six days and enjoy Sabbath and new moons with their prince, their, their Melchizedek princely priest. Who are the rest of the nations that's left behind, that's still on earth? Zechariah 14 verse 16 Remember Zechariah, the last chapter, is prophesying the age to come. And it shall be that all who are left from all the nations which came up against Jerusalem. What, are you, what is he talking about? If you read Revelation, you'll see that all the nations will come up to fight against Jerusalem. You know, this is in Armageddon, before the first resurrection. They who are left after Armageddon, that didn't die in Armageddon, or during the tribulation, or during the Third World War, and they who are not part of the first resurrection. Um, it says, all the nations that are left from um, them who came up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to bow themselves to the king, Yahuwah of hosts, and to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. Remember how our prince will celebrate all the feast days, all the new moons, and all the Sabbaths? And here it says in Zechariah 14 that the nations that's left on the earth after Armageddon, who does not come up to Jerusalem where we are staying, to celebrate the feast of Sukkot with us and our king, they will receive no rain. Here it is, verse 17, verse 18. And if all the nations of Egypt does not come up, so they're living still in Egypt, and all the other nations are, you know, living wherever they are, but if they don't come up to Jerusalem, so if um, Egypt doesn't come up and enter, they'll have no rain. But on them will be the plague with which Yahuwah plagues the nations who do not come up to cel celebrate the festival of Sukkot. So here again, um, like we saw in all the previous prophecies, our prince will lead our worship during the Holy Feast days. And here clearly it says, if you don't want to keep the Holy Feast days, which is called, you know, Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, a beautiful Messianic celebration. If you don't want to celebrate that year on earth, good luck to you if you are then not in covenant with Yahuwah. And you might survive Armageddon and everything that happens in the last days. And you are still on earth around during the millennium. 
then you're going to celebrate Sukkot, whether you want to or not. Because if you don't celebrate it, you'll be plagued by God and you'll receive no rain. It will be suffering on the earth while the rest of the people who are in covenant with God are living in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land, with their prince who celebrates the Feast of Sukkot. So, covenant obedience and Holy Feast Day celebrations are confirmed over and over and over again. I've shown you now in the Old Testament prophets. So, in the millennium, after the Armageddon War and the First Resurrection, when the Prince of Peace starts ruling for a thousand years on earth from Jerusalem, then um, we will celebrate the Feast of Sukkot as well as all the other feasts, all the Sabbaths, all the new moons, all the holy days. So, in Revelation 19, verse 19, it explains the Armageddon. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to fight him who sat on the horse and his army. So, then you've got this Armageddon war, you've got the first resurrection, where Yeshua then gathers his people. You've got the nations on earth gathering around Jerusalem. And after Armageddon, Satan is bound for a thousand years. Of course, we see here in Revelation 19 that the beast and the false prophet and the whore and all the kings of the earth that followed them, you know, God deals with them. But Satan himself will then, after the thousand years that he was locked up in Abyssos, not hell, Please do my Bible studies on where the hell do we go when we when we die. He is then Satan is then released over the thousand years in Abyssos, and then he goes out. Well, then we have the second resurrection, and then Satan goes out and gathers all the nations again against Jerusalem, and that's when the New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, and God finally destroys them with a fire from His mouth. That is the war of Gog and Magog. If I read Revelation, Armageddon is before the millennium, Gog and Magog is after the millennium. Then Yeshua, remember now, this is when all the nations, remember here in Zechariah, all the nations that are left, all of those who are left from all the nations that came up against Jerusalem. And here, of course, all the armies that were against Jerusalem. Out of Yeshua's mouth goes a sharp sword, and with that he smite the nations. And then he will rule them or shepherd them with a rod of iron. So Yeshua rules, he's the rule of the king. This rod of iron is the ruling of the king during the millennium. So for us, he doesn't have to rule us with a rod of iron. He rules us with his staff. He is our shepherd, our king, our priest. And we are his sheep that has come home to him. But the nations that are left from those who are against Jerusalem, against the covenant that God has with Jerusalem and with the people living in Jerusalem, those nations will be ruled with a rod of iron, according to the book of Revelation. So let me just remind you again, the nations in the age to come will say, let us go up to the mountain of Yahuwah. Why? Because if you do not come up, you'll receive no rain and you'll receive plagues. So in Micah um, chapter 4 verse 2, many nations in the end days will say, let's go up to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the house of the God of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. This is not the God of the Gentiles. The Gentiles must be grafted into the olive tree, become part of the nation of Israel. One nation, one king. And this one nation with their one king is at Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So the rest of the nations that are left on the earth will go up to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways. And we will learn to walk in his path. For the law will go forth out of Zion. And the word of Yahuwah, from Jerusalem. So Zion and Jerusalem is where the word of God will come from. And here we see that Zion and Jerusalem is the place where his law and his word will come from. The law and the word is the same thing. So when we say Yeshua is the word of God, John 1 verse 1, from the beginning, then the law of God 
is the word of God. Because if you think about it, you know, the law is the only part of the whole Bible that God spoke with his own voice, wrote with his own finger. And of course, Yeshua says, um, the greatest commandment is, Yer Israel, love the Lord your God. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two hang the rest of the law and the prophets. And then you go um, and you divide those two greatest commandments into the Ten Commandments, which are just a summary of the rest of the 613 commandments that God gives to us in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Please do yourself a favor. Study these books with two trees in the garden to understand that God's law is eternal. It was there from Genesis. And you can see here, it will still be here in the age to come. And it is here, according to Zechariah, that we will dwell safely in Jerusalem. So we see again, like I tried to tell you, and I'm going to show you, Revelation confirms that only Israel lives in Jerusalem. Revelation 21 verse 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Um, we, we saw this mountain is Mount Zion. And he showed me the great city, not Joburg or London, but the holy Jerusalem that came out of heaven from God. And he showed me a great and high wall of what? Of this city, Jerusalem. And this wall had 12 gates. The 12 gates of what? Into Jerusalem. And at the gates, 12 angels. Which angels? Well, the 12 angels at the 12 gates going into Jerusalem. And the names written thereon. What names? Written on what? Well, the names written on the 12 gates. Remember, all that stays in Jerusalem are Israel, those that God gathered out of all the nations. Because the names of the 12 gates of this new Jerusalem that John sees are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. How on earth can we serve God as one body in Messiah if everyone sets his own covenant conditions? I try to show you in this study what the covenant conditions for the age to come will be so that you can see that the teaching of dispensation that says Old Testament is for Jew, New Testament is for Christian, that that dispensational uh, doctrine are the doctrines of demons. Nowhere does God or Yeshua or any of the prophets or apostles ever say, choose from the conditions that suits you. And God says, I'll be just too happy at least you're serving me. Remember how I showed you. In the last verse in Isaiah 66, that's all about the age to come. And they'll go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. And I ask you the question, what does it mean to transgress against God? Do you have a list, your own list, your own conditions of what you think transgressions are and what you think the covenant is all about? Does your church have a list? Isn't it time that we look at God's list, his Torah, his law, his word? Yeshua said you'll be great when you do that. So nowhere does anyone in the Bible, especially the one that you must be obedient to, God, your creator, and Yeshua, your Messiah, nowhere do they ever say, say, choose from the conditions that suit you. Choose the conditions that fit your New Testament doctrine. Choose from the conditions that you like. They say nothing like that. We serve one Abba Creator, Almighty God. I showed you Zechariah. I showed you Deuteronomy. I showed you the book of Mark. I showed you what Yeshua said. And when we serve Him, we do what He tells us to do. We cannot cherry pick which of His commandments is for us and which is for Israel. I've shown you that if you are not coming into Israel, you are still part of the Gentile nations. You need to come out of your Gentile background, like Paul says in Ephesians 2, where in times past you walked according to the courses of this world, according to the prince of power, who works in the children of disobedience, those who do not obey God, among whom we also were Gentiles. You know, um, by nature we are children of wrath. We are falling under the curse of death. 
but God in his great mercy and his great love where, wherewith he loves us, even when we were dead in our sins, have made us alive in Messiah. Because why? By grace are we saved. So Gentile, I myself, all of us, not born in the bloodlines of anybody who claims to be Israel or Jewish, we are all uh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel scattered into the Gentile nations. We must come out of our Egyptian death so that we can be saved by the blood of the um, Pesach lamb on the doorpost. We are saved by grace purely. Salvation is always by grace for any Gentile who then comes into covenant with God and become like um, Ruth said, your God is now my God and your people is now my people. So we become part of God's people. And now that we are part of his people, how do we live? We live according to his covenant and his promises that he made to our father, Abraham. Paul explains it beautifully, and I showed you in the prophets where it says we will be one nation. Paul helps us to understand that we will be one in Messiah. Therefore, remember that you were Gentiles in the past. And at that time that you were Gentiles, you were without Messiah. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. This is Paul. So you need to see that Paul agrees with Revelation and all the prophets I've shown you. You were Gentiles in the flesh, and as such, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and you were strangers to the covenant, God's covenant that is described in his promises and his instructions to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. We were Gentiles. We had no hope. But now... In Messiah, we who were far off, we who were scattered into every Gentile nation, can now come close through the blood of Messiah. So as a reminder, we serve one amazing God that wants to have one nation under one rule with one covenant, not choosing your own covenant. This is God's ultimate plan for the age to come. That was his ultimate plan from the beginning. Our biggest problem is that the church system have preached dispensation from the early church fathers who hated anything so-called Jewish and changed everything to suit their New Testament church doctrine. We read in Romans 12 and many other places how Paul, who clearly states for us and agree with all the prophets of the Old Testament, as well as Yeshua and all the other apostles, that every Gentile who wishes to serve God is brought into covenant with the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember when we started this journey together in session one, how God said through the prophet Ezekiel, in order that the house of Israel will no longer transgress against me. Thus they will be my people, and I will be their God. And I will bring them back to Jerusalem. They'll be my people, and I'll be their God. 2 Corinthians 6. What agreement does do we have with the temples of idols? No, God says, I will... Um, when in the age to come, I will dwell in them and walk among them and be their God, and they'll be my people. Hebrews 8, this is the covenant with the house of Israel. I'll write my Torah on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. Deuteronomy 30, love Yahuwah, obey his voice, cling to him, for he is your life, and you will dwell in the land that God swore to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob in the new Jerusalem, in the age to come. Isaiah 56, any stranger, any man, woman, or child from any Gentile nation that joins themselves to Yahuwah to serve him, to love him, and to be his servants, who keeps the Sabbath and takes hold of the covenant, them will I bring to my holy mountain, and I'll make them joyful in my house of prayer. And that is why there's only 12 gates in the New Jerusalem. There's not an extra gate for anyone that is not grafted into the olive tree. Yeshua's blood redeemed us from the curse of the law, which is death, because the wages of sin is death, Romans 3. And sin's definition is breaking the law, 1 John 3 verse 4 and 
the rest of the Bible. Yeshua did not set us free from obedience to His Father. He set us free from the death penalty we deserve because we disobeyed the Father. A clean, washed, freed and loving bride serves God on God's terms, not her own, because God has always ruled His people on His terms and He will continue to do so in the age to come. Isn't this lamp supposed to be you? You see, I am the servant lamp, I am the vine. You are the branches that bring forth the fruit. Let the blossoms appear.